Joining me now to discuss this, uh, former BBC presenter Roger Bolton is with us. Afternoon to you, Roger. Afternoon. Uh, I mean, firstly, it's just worth a note on that point. Who'd have thought it? I mean, 1995, how we all looked on this incredible interview, this diligent young journalist, Martin Bashir, 32 at the time, had scooped this incredible booking, a senior royal. They hardly speak on anything, let alone their internal marital affairs. Um, and here it was. Uh, but, of course, as the years went on, and we now know... It was all based on a pack of lies. It was the worst kind of journalism. It was scurrilous and um, almost criminal in some respects, some might say. But uh, the story isn't over. And here's the BBC again finding itself up to its neck in accusations that it's still covering something up. Well, can we unpack that? I mean, there's no, no question that Martin Bashir behaved disgracefully, deceitfully, and deserved to be fired for the way he got the interview. But what people forget is that Diana wanted to give that interview. She would have given it to somebody. It just happened in the end to be Martin Bashir. She'd recorded her voice, uh, her interview, and given it to Andrew Morton, who'd written a book based upon it. She talked to a number of people, including Sir Max Hastings, editor of the Daily Telegraph, saying, I want to give an interview. So there's no question Diana would have given the interview mm. to somebody. Now, whether if, or not... What, what, whether she if, would have said what she said, that's the question, isn't it? Well, she'd have said most of what she said, but you're absolutely right to say, perhaps because of the deceit and the yeah. lies she was told, she went further. But she wanted to end the marriage. She wanted to reveal what she think, thought was the terrible way she'd been treated. So there would have been an interview. Whether it would have been this interview is a different matter. So I think it, where I also disagree with part of the analysis you said, there's no question that following that there was a BBC cover-up. To be fair to the present administration of the BBC, they got Judge Dyson in, and two years ago, three years ago, he had access to all of these emails, and he came out, and the BBC accepted all the findings, and they were terrible about what happened 25 years ago. The assertion that there's a cover-up today, I don't think is proven. Why might, Roger, why might, uh, and I know there can be lots of reasons, redactions happen for a variety of re innocent parties could be casually referenced in something but have nothing to do with something. Um, but it, it's still, journalistically, I think you would ask the same question. You know, why is some of this redacted? What is in there that we're not allowed to see? Perfectly reasonable well, to ask that. It's, it's, mm, it's suspicious, isn't it? I mean, in a way, it's a question of trust. Do you, should we? trust the BBC? Should we trust this Director General? On the whole, I give him the benefit of the doubt. I think he's a very straight guy. I think he's been very open the moment the Dyson, uh, the moment it came to his attention, he had the Dyson inquiry and so on. There are a number of reasons why they might have been reluctant. They're worried about the precedent. I mean, if you're going to have, you know, if you're going to have all your editorial conferences taped and available to the public, and suppose in the middle of them you say, which of course is not the case, oh, crikey, my wife's wrong, my wife wants a divorce, I'll have to explain why I can't appear and whatever. There are a whole range of private things where you would legitimately think, why should that be made public? But as a public service broadcast, the BBC has to be more public than most. So I think, you know, that, that there's a reason for redacting, but it's worrying. And, and which is why I think it's, it's now being suggested another court order uh, be, be put out there to try and get the unredacted uh, emails or perhaps at the very least maybe some detail on the reasons for the redactions. And because there might be, as you rightly say, and I, I made the same point at the beginning, there, there could be an innocent party in there, there could be, you know, people thinking aloud within an email about one subject, you might reference another, blah, blah, blah. We all get that, but bearing in mind this whole story, uh, the, the, the beginnings of this story is about deceit. And here we are, 30 years later, dealing with the same corporation who aren't being up completely up front, I think that's fair, as to yeah, why they've on, the had to... Corporation. Yeah, why Sorry. they've had to block out certain parts of the email. Did you say it's not the same corporation? No, well, it is the same corporation, but it's under different management. It was 30 well, years yes, ago, it, and that doesn't it, it. But it, let's get that in proportion. Also, let's be also aware there's a campaign against the BBC now by a variety of people who want to get it. Uh, so we've got to allow for that as well. I think what you've got here, though, is there is a conspiracy theory I do not share. And the conspiracy theory goes like this, and I think Earl Spencer believes it. I think Andy Webb, who's the investigative journalist who's done brilliant work, believes it. We are told Prince William, Prince Harry believe it. 
In other words, there's a direct relationship, that there is a direct relationship between the interview that Diana gave and her death only a few years later in Paris. The suggestion being if, if, if the interview hadn't happened, uh, she wouldn't have ended up where she did. I think that's a big stretch. I don't think there's any real connection. She died because she was in a car with a man who was driving, was drunk. Nobody knew that. It's a perfectly straightforward, horrible accident. But, but people like Earl Spencer believe that Diana ended up where she did in Paris because of this interview. And that drives them on. I think that's a conspiracy too far. What is absolutely true is the BBC management, shortly afterwards, knew what had happened, knew what Martin Bashir has done, were very slow, to say the least, to deal with it, covered up various details. And uh, Judge Dyson laid that out about two years ago, and the BBC paid compensation to various people, including a graphics artist who was unfairly blamed. They apologized to Earl Spencer and so on. That's this administration clearing up after the last one. I hope, please God, this administration is not covering up now. Yeah, I'm, I tend to agree with much of what you said there, Roger, but although I do... One of the areas that I, 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 I'm constantly amazed still have is this groupthink uh, kind of scenario that seems to occur in big corporations, even corporations that purport to be, you know, far more open and progressive and we've learnt our lessons from the past, whether you're talking about a big energy company or anything else, there is this, we must at all costs save the corporation. Sometimes I think that's conscious, sometimes I just think it sits within the DNA of, of people that work in those roles. You've got a long career in television, you know some of these senior execs. Similarly, I do too. I've had these discussions with them, not specifically on this, but just on that idea that there is a sort of a... Uh, when in the cartel, when in the inner sanctum, you behave in a way that you wouldn't behave if you were outside of it. So even allowing for the fact these are new players, there are, you know, d d different cast of senior execs over there at the BBC, there is a danger, perhaps, uh, which is why I think we have suspicion on these redactions, that despite uh, think, uh, the change, despite the new intentions, the same old game could still be played, and that is, no, we protect the corporation at all costs. Well, I mean, I, I, I take the general point, which is institutions tend to protect themselves. Look at the Roman Catholic Church or the Church of England in question yep. of child, abuse, child sexual abuse. Good example, and, yeah. And the BBC in the past, and people would say, look, um, you know, our enemies are out there, this is a fault, but, you know, we've got to protect Mother Church or we've got to protect Mother BBC. That's... That's uh, all institutions behave like that. Nice, by the way, not just the corporations. I dare say even talk TV might behave like that if it found something which was difficult. Because it's a human tendency, which is... But this is a public service organisation owned theoretically by the public. The reason I think it's different this time, you've got people on BBC board, after all, you know, like Robbie Gibb uh, put there, who was a Tory who was running Downing Street Communications for Theresa May, uh, who is um, certainly, is by self-confessed, Brexiteer right-winger. He's sitting in the middle of the editorial uh, complaint system there for them, a non-executive director, whatever. Uh, there's no way he would he would be part of that uh, cover-up. Uh, I think there's a lot more... The BBC is a lot more accountable now. It's accountable to Ofcom and the regulator. I think this just underlines the fact that you can't ultimately trust institutions to police themselves. They, you know, they can't mark their own homework. You must always have people outside who regulate. Yeah. But I believe in this instance, and I hope I'm not proved wrong, that actually there is no longer a big cover-up. But there was, it was disgraceful, yeah. and Martin Bashir behaved disgraceful, and it's perhaps the worst actually blot on the BBC's record there's been. Indeed. Roger, um, thank you. Always good to get your take on these things. Roger Bolton, former BBC presenter, with us on the programme. We've been on.